Hello everyone. Today is my great pleasure, uh, great pr pleasure to <laughs> introduce <laughs> our guest speaker David Dis from Victoria University of Wellington. Um, David uh, did a PhD um, from Imperial College London, where he uh, did some research work on point analysis, mm -hmm. and uh, some of his technique has been used in GCC. Yeah. After PhD, he moved to New Zealand to become a lecturer. Yep. I believe he's now enjoying life in New Zealand. <laughs> 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 uh, so in the last uh, few years, David has been uh, working on a new program <coughs> language called uh, Wiley, which focuses on program verification to ensure programs meet their specifications. And in, in this talk, David uh, is going to give us um, a view of what he thinks the future program language <laughs> should look like <laughs> by using his own experience of developing and using his uh, Wiley language. So without further ado, let's welcome David. Cool. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm definitely enjoying life in New Zealand. Um, I even got my passport just a few weeks ago, well, a couple of months ago, actually. Um, so, yeah, I feel like I'm now officially a Kiwi, which is great. <laughs> so, yeah, the title of my talk is a little bit, um, I suppose, it's a little bit provocative. Um, I am, I guess I'm going to try and give you a, a glimpse of one possible future. And, you know, I'm going to use my programming language, yeah, um, but I'm not necessarily suggesting my programming language is the future, okay? It's more the programming experience and what it might be like. Um, and hopefully you'll, you'll get a feel for it. I'm going to do a fair bit of live demo. Um, and hopefully from that you'll get a feel for, you know, how things might, might proceed in the future, I guess. We'll see. Um, and please feel free to ask lots of questions, okay? The, the demo part especially works a lot better um, if everyone's asking questions and we're just trying stuff out, all right? Because it's kind of, it's part of the fun. Cool, okay, uh, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so I've sort of done the introduction, so I'm David Pierce. Um, uh, yeah, I'm a lecturer, I've done work on static analysis and so on and so on, and this, this new tool I've been working on since about 2009, um, this Wiley tool, um, and it kind of comes out of my interest in static analysis you know, it's all about finding bugs in software, and that's what I'm still very interested in. Um, but y you do always have this issue with static analysis of precision, right? And I've been talking already today, some people, about precision. And I, I always wanted the most precise static analysis that I could possibly imagine. And this is why I, how I sort of ended up getting into program verification. Because in program verification, we have heaps and heaps of information. And the tools that we're using are very, very precise. And they reason about, you know, arithmetic, and arrays very, very, in a very precise manner. I guess that's how I got into it. Um, okay, so verification is not a new idea. I'm sure many of you um, know, uh, know about program verification. Uh, okay, so just some, some quotes. Um, it's clear to all the best minds in the field that a more mathematical approach is needed for software to progress much. Um, that was Bertram Meyer. Uh, it is clear to formal Methodists like ourselves, for some of whom formal methods can be something of a religion, um, that introducing greater rigor into software development will improve the software development process and result in software that's better structured and more maintainable and, and so on and so on. Now, I don't really need to convince most of you folks of that, I think, because you, you're already well into this kind of idea. Um, you know, and if you look through, if you go and you look back through the academic literature, you know, there are thousands and thousands of quotes and papers that talk about software verification and that we should be verifying our programs as correct and all these kinds of things. And in fact, you can actually trace it all the way back. Um, there's a quote by Alan Turing in 1949 where he talks about using assertions for checking program correctness, which is kind of amazing for me because it means that th you know, this idea of using verification goes all the way back to the very beginning of computer science. Um, so yeah. Uh, but the question is, okay, it's an, a long-standing idea in computer science. It's been around forever. So how are we doing with this idea? You know, how are we going with it, right? And uh, so I've got a, just a couple of examples. I mean, again, you know, I don't necessarily need to convince you folks of, of this. Um, but there's just a couple of examples here, some of which, uh, well, uh, you know, you will know of, right? Um, so the first one is the aeroplane. Um, so anyone, does anyone know anything about the, uh, the aeroplane? What, what, was, what was the bug with the aeroplane? Hmm. This is a uh, Air New Zealand. It's, it's, a, it's a black plane, okay? It's not a cargo plane. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, 
passenger airliner, right? Um, this was about 2014. Hmm, thoughts, thoughts. What was the problem? Hmm. So this is a uh, Boeing 787 Dreamliner. How much does a 787 Dreamliner cost? What do we think? Ballpark figures. How much, sorry? 100 million. 100 million, okay, not bad. Any other suggestions? A billion, that's a lot. <laughs> um, 250 million US dollars, right? So if you want to buy one of these planes, if you're in New Zealand and you want to buy one of these planes, 250 million US dollars, okay? And it ships with a software bug, right? An integer overflow, okay? Which means that after, I think it's 220 days of continuous operation, the integer overflow kicks in, it overflows, and that cuts out all of the electronics on the plane, right? And if you're mid-flight, that is a catastrophic failure because you can't restart anything, unfortunately. Um, Hopefully, they patched that bug by now. That was a couple of years ago. But at the time, the recommended safety procedure was to reboot the plane, right? 250 million US dollars, and you have to reboot it every 90 days is what they set the, the, the rough idea out, OK? You know. Uh, and it's an integer overflow. An integer overflow is not a new kind of bug, right? I mean, this is not a new thing that goes back. OK. Um, Okay, so what about this one? So the title's giving us away a lot of information here. What do we think about this one? Okay, it's a buffer overflow, that's right, yeah. So basically, you know, as you guys are very well aware with buffer overflows, um, it just meant that, that someone could make a request. So it's for open SSL, right, which is why they use SSL implementation. Um, you can make a request, and then it just meant that you could read arbitrary bits of memory. You didn't necessarily have control over what memory you were re reading, but if you fished enough, you were going to pick out some interesting credit card details or, you know, login information and so on and so forth. I think this one is really interesting because um, it's open SSL, so it's an open source project um, and there's definitely, you know, been this kind of idea that open source projects should lead to fewer bugs in software, right? Um, but actually in this case, you know, because you have sort of more people looking at the code, they're going to find it more quickly, right? But in this case, the bug was actually added to the code pace about two years before they eventually found the problem, right? So it had sat there in the code base, presumably with some people looking at it, but they still didn't find it. So, you know, it's definitely telling us that, that we need better tools, right? And I think, I think you guys probably agree with that. Um, and so uh, there are lots of different approaches you can take to, um, uh, you know, to finding bugs in software. And I guess I'm taking a very specific approach here, which is uh, software verification as opposed to static analysis. Um, and it comes back to this kind of, uh, this grand challenge. So Sir Tony Hoare, um, Professor Sir Tony Hoare, I guess, um, came up with this grand challenge for computer science. This is back in 2003. So some time ago, which is to build a verifying compiler which uses automated mathematical and logical reasoning methods to check the correctness of programs that it compiles. Hmm, what does that mean is an interesting question. But the good news is you don't have to worry about what it means because we're going to see my interpretation of what it means later, right? And you can decide for yourself. I actually got to meet Tony for the first time just earlier this year in Cambridge and he saw um, some of the demo that I'm about to show you and he said, yeah, that's really cool, I like it. And I was like, yes, great. <laughs> um, I was very happy about that, so yeah. Um, cool, and yeah, just, this is just talking about verifying compilers. So this idea of a verifying compiler um, is also still itself not new. And the very first, well, one of the earliest kinds of uh, verifying compilers is this thing called the Stanford Pascal Verifier, which is quite influential. You know, and if you look very carefully at this paper, right, that's 1979. That was just a year after I was born. So people have been trying to build these things for a long time. Um, and you know, I guess the takeaway message is we still, we're not using them. You know, programmers are not using them every day. So we've got this great idea, which is presumably a great idea, um, and a lot of work, but still we haven't really got a product that people are using. And that, I guess, is what I'm trying to do. And you have to decide for yourself if we're making progress on, on that goal. Um, so yeah, so Wiley is a programming language. Um, and we're going to see it in a moment, so I won't spend too long on this. But um, the key thing is that it allows you to write these um, specifications, so pre and post conditions, um, and we'll see some other aspects of it as well. Uh, and then it will check them at compile time for you. That's really the key thing. Um, you know, uh, 
uh, I'm trying to think what else I want to say. I basically just want to show it to you more than anything. Um, <laughs> Um, obviously, there's a whole bunch of issues here. Performance is a key one of the verification system. And I, I guess the thing to think about is, as you watch the demo, <coughs> think about the performance, right? Is it fast enough? That's an interesting question. You'll have to judge for yourself. Cool. Um, and Wiley is an open source project. It's been going since about 2009. This is uh, from uh, Olo, or whatever it's called now. I can't remember what it's called. Open Hub, I think it's called now. Um, it's telling us lines of code of the project as it's progressed over time. And we can see that, ignoring that weird glitch, um, it's kind of gone up. And we've hit peak code about here in January 2015. And then I've actually started to go down. Some of these jumps are as I actually pull out components and put them into separate repositories, actually. But generally speaking, um, the project is on a downhill, which I think is a good sign. Because at some point, you have too much stuff in your language or in your system, and you realize you can't possibly make all of that work, and so you start throwing stuff out, right? And it's at that point when you know exactly what you want to do um, and the things that you don't need that you can really start to focus it down. So hopefully, um, it's making progress. Yeah, the compiler is, depending on how you count it, roughly 80,000 lines of code, something like that. Um, but yeah, it's open source. It's on GitHub and so on and so forth. And you can go to wiley.org as well and check out stuff on there. Cool, cool. Welcome to the future. Ooh, ooh. This is the bit where I go. Ooh. All right. Um, yeah. So this is kind of. Uh, I guess we're imagining that we are now a programmer and we're writing code um, at some point in the future, and this is just a normal day in our life, right? I guess that's kind of vaguely the idea. Um, so we're going to move into the demo. So hopefully that that looks like it's. Reason. Can you see that at the back? I might just make it a bit bigger. How's that? That's not too bad there. Is that all right to see? Yeah? All right. OK, cool. So I'm going to sit down. Um, and we're just going to start with a couple of relatively simple examples. And then we'll move on to um, uh, sort of the most interesting one. And if there's a bit of time at the end, I might do a few specific things about um, SQL injections as well at the end, just seeing as I've been talking about them with people. So, OK, cool. All right. So. I'm going to define the absolute function. Um, so let's just start with this. Um, so this is obviously not an implementation of the absolute function, but it, it's working, right? Um, so what do I want to say about the absolute function? What are the, what's the like specification? What things might I say about the absolute function? What do you think? Hmm. Sorry, sorry, Ghana. Non-negative. Okay, so let's say that, right? So here's my um, post condition, which is the insurers clause, and it's basically saying the return value r has got to be greater than or equal to zero. Now, if I try and verify this, well, actually, it's going to go, yeah, that's fine, right? Because um, you know, that's okay. But if I pass in minus one, um, then we can see here that it's going to give us, uh, 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 it's going to say, no, that doesn't work. Right, um, And if I tried to pass in, in fact, what we might do is we'll turn on the counterexample generation. So the counterexample generation is a relatively new feature. So I'm just warning you, new feature alert. I, I put it together on the plane flying from Wellington to Brisbane, um, and it, which is not bad for a four-hour trip, but it is surprisingly effective. But sometimes it does cause problems, and I'll turn it off just to prove that it's that causing the problem, not something else. Okay, um, So let's just do this. So if we try x, so if we return to x, then obviously x could be minus 1 um, because you know, I'm not doing anything inside my method. The return value should be greater than 0. x can be anything. Um, it's saying, no, that's a problem. And you can see here that it's giving me my counterexample, right? which is, yeah, x could be minus 1. OK, so now we've got a, we kind of got a plan. OK, so let's try and write the body. So let's go, um, if x is greater than or equal to 0, return x or else return. I'm just going to return minus 1 there. Like, OK, there's a bug, obviously. Um, I'm not a very good programmer. I'm just, you know, messing away. Um, and so it's going to say, oh, post condition not satisfied. Hmm, OK, there's my counterexample. So now we can fix it. Um, and we can go like this. But let's, yeah, we can introduce another bug, because we want to be really, we love introducing bugs. Is, this gonna, is that going to work? I wonder if that's going to work. It might do. Yeah, OK, cool. Uh, so this is my program uh, thus far. Uh, and I've deliberately put a bug into it, so I need to strengthen my specification. What, what should I say? 
What else do I want to say here? Uh, greater than x, greater than equal x. Think? Don't know. Don't know if that's that. What else do I want to say about my absolute? What, what are the things that we know that it should be doing? The value should definitely be greater than or equal to zero. What else is true? Like, if I just return zero, is that the absolute function? Hmm. Okay, what does that mean? Same magnitude. Okay, so how might I say that? <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. I like that answer. I, I'm going to put it in because I know that it works. It wouldn't be my natural choice, but it's, a, it's very clever. Uh, you think equal. Yeah, you're right. Um, okay, it's very clever. <laughs> I, I wouldn't write that. <laughs> I would be like, that's too complicated for me to write, but, but that's okay. It, it works <laughs> as it happens. And so now we can see that, yeah, it's telling me, okay, um, that my post condition is not satisfied, right? Um, this squaring is nice because basically it's getting rid of the negative. So if we had a minus and a minus, right, it's quite cute. Um, okay, so I can fix my program, right, if I do this, and hopefully, fingers crossed, um, and it actually, it likes it, right? Um, what I would have written would be the simpler version of that is uh, x equals r or minus x equals r, right, which is roughly what you're trying to say with the sign. Because we know that I've got r greater than or equal to zero, then I know that it's a positive value, basically. So it's either returning x or it's returning, you know, minus x, right? And then that's going to work fine as well. And again, if we put something in here, then um, it's going to tell us that's a problem. All right, good. Cool. Everyone? Yep. All right. Okay, uh, so let's, let's do something a bit more complicated. Index of. So it's when it's going to start to get a bit more interesting. Um, so index of is a classic function in, um, let's just go with that. Classic function, say in Java, there's Java lang string index of, right? It returns the index of an item in the array, or in this case, we'll say it returns minus one if there's no match of that item, all right? Um, so, okie dokie. Uh, and we'll ignore, yeah, we'll just keep it at that at this stage. It can return any matching item. It doesn't matter. We might refine that a bit later. Um, so what, what, my, what is my specification here? What do I want to say about my index of function? What should be between 0 and uh, length of function? Like that. So we've got the error condition as well, right? So I might want to put in, I'm going to go maybe minus 1, because if, because if it's not in there, I need to return minus 1. But otherwise, yeah, not bad. OK, cool. All right, yeah, I don't mind that. That's good. What else? What else do we want to say about this function? So is that, is that OK as it is? But you need R to be greater than minus 1. R should not be minus 1. So if we had r is greater than equal to zero, then, yeah, that's not bad. OK, good. So what that means at the moment, this should fail, which it does. And it's giving me my counter example, which is where I've got item zero and uh, items is that thing. And I'm returning zero. So that doesn't, that's not making sense here, because I'm returning greater than equal to zero. But that's not true, um, if that makes sense. Reading the counter examples is a little bit tricky sometimes. Um, let's flesh out, but if I return minus one, that's what I was going to say, uh, then that's okay under my specification at the moment. Okay, so let's, that, I think that's going to do well to start with. Let's leave it now, um, and we'll just put out the implementation. Uh, right. Return minus one, that's what I said, wasn't it? Okay. All right, so that's my kind of function. It, uh, not super complicated, but it does the job. Um, okay, so we're going to try and verify it. So the first thing that we notice, and this is, this is where our verification gets interesting, and it definitely starts to diverge from sort of traditional static analysis, right? Dealing with loops is complicated. Um, OK, so it thinks that i could be out of bounds, could be negative. All right, that's what it's saying. So it thinks i could be negative. And if we, if we look at the counterexample, and if we know how to read the counterexample, because it's not completely clear, we're actually going to ignore that version of i, because this is like the latest version of i, right? And it's saying that it thinks i could be minus 1 at that point. Now, if i could be minus 1 at that point, we would obviously have a problem there. Um, if we look at the program, 
if I move the error message out of the way, if we look at the program, we know that I starts at zero, it always goes up. There's no modular arithmetic in my language as well, just so there's no overflow. Um, so we know that actually I will never be negative, right? But the, the verification system is not that smart, right? Reasoning about loops is tricky, um, and so we need to help it. We need to write a loop invariant, right? A loop invariant is just something that's going to be true of every iteration of the loop. So what would be a good loop invariant here? <coughs> Any thoughts? Mm. The i is greater than equal to zero. That's right. Well, let's get it right. There we go. Okay, so now we're starting to make progress. And what I'm going to do is start to show some of the other features of Wiley. So I'm going to define a type natural, um, which is basically an integer x where x is greater than or equal to zero. And the cool thing about that is I can now get rid of my loop invariant, and I can just put that down here on my, um, on my declaration for i. And that basically just means i is now a variable that can never be negative. Uh, and we can check that. You know, if I was going to do something weird like assign it minus 1, sake of argument, OK, type invariant not satisfied. Oh, it doesn't produce a counterexample. That's interesting. OK, I haven't had much chance to, to test this yet. But <laughs> yeah, OK, so it doesn't produce a counterexample in that case. I wonder to think about why that is. But anyway, um, but we can see the point is it is telling me I can't do that, right? I can't just assign. So what if, if I assigned item, for example, as another example, um, I don't know anything. I've got no constraints on the value of item. So at that point, again, it's telling me no. And ah, now it does. Huh. The excitement. Anyway, um, you get the idea. OK, so what's interesting here is that the code is kind of working, but we haven't got a strong enough specification, right? If I cut out all that stuff, at that point, my, my code is still working. So what else do I need to say about my post condition? Go on. Line on 5 should be an uh, equivalence rather than implication. But if, if there exists an element, I should be returning you mean, uh, you're thinking something like that. Yeah. Because if, if I can't find an item, I cannot return minus one, right? I'm just thinking about whether or not that's <laughs> how that's going to work. <laughs> I, I, I see the logic. I need to think about it. You, you're, you're getting at the right thing. Yeah, I don't think that it's not going to like that, although you, you're basically getting at the right thing. So, what, so say it out. Spill it out in English, right? You're thinking about the other case. Yeah, so if the item actually exists, Yep. In, then, in, in the array. OK. Then we've got to find it, right? So in that case, if we return greater than or equal to 0, then we know it must be the item. So we've got that case covered. And so the other case is, if it's negative, then it's not there. Then it's not there, yeah, right? That's, that's, the that's what you're trying. Exactly. The negation of what I say. Exactly, that's right. That's right. Um, uh, so we can write that using a quantifier. I'm going to say. Um, for all k in naught up to size of items, um, what is it, items k does not equal item? Yeah, basically, for everything in the items array, there's nothing that equals item if it's less than, equal, less than zero. Yeah, so I'm using quantifiers, and we'll get rid of them in a moment. Um, but now we've got a, a post condition not satisfied. <laughs> the excitement. Um, this is an interesting one, because it's saying that it, it thinks we could have items here that has got uh, one element you know, one element zero in it, and we can have item as being zero, but we didn't find it in that loop, right? Um, which we know as humans isn't exactly possible. Um, that loop should have found it. Uh, and what it's telling me is we need another loop invariant. So what, what might the loop invariant be? Basically, I guess the key to think about loop invariants is when we get to this point in the program after the loop, what we know is the loop invariant itself, and we know the negated condition, and that's it. So, what what might we want to say? Yeah. You have to say something like item is not present till items list starting from zero to i minus one. Okay. Aha. My diagram. Aha. Okay. Yes. That's right. So we can imagine uh, the green is what we've looked at. So we've checked each of the green boxes is not equal to the item, right? And the blue ones are the ones that we're remaining to do, right? So as we're going through, we're basically just increasing the space that we know that we've checked. And when we get to the end of the loop, we'll know that we've checked all of them, and therefore it's not in there at all, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we can put that in pretty easily. I'm just going to cut and paste it, basically, almost. Uh, cut and paste it like that. I wonder what it'll do. So that's not quite right yet, because it's not exactly what you said. Um, 
and you can see that it's saying loop invariant doesn't hold on entry because it's, it's given me a, a correct counterexample, which is an items which has got one element in it, and I'm looking for item zero, which is the, the match, right? But I is only zero at that point, and so it's not the case there that, you know, that going all the way up to the end of the array, items doesn't equal item. It should only be the case that up to I that doesn't equal item, right? Which is what you said, because it's, a, it's like an inductive invariant, right? So if I change it like that, now we're making progress. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Good. Um, okay. Uh, -da 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 -da. So let's now, what I want to do is I want to show a few more features, is what I want to do. So I'm going to write a contains function. Uh, and we'll start, yeah, well, I'm going to put a bound on it like this. So it's, it's a property. I'm calling it a property. It's not a function. It's something that we're going to use for verification to help us, right? It, you can think of it almost as being like a macro, really. Um, so, and let's just take this out. And so what it's going to say is, well, if contains is true, then the item is in the array items, whoops, there's a typo, um, between 0 and up to n. And I'm choosing up to n because I know that it's going to be useful later on, right? Um, so I'm going to say, I'm going to use an existential. I'm going to go, there is some k in 0 up to the size of items, where items k equals like that, which is quite nice because then I can go, not contains items, item, and then I can put the size of items for, my, uh, for the post condition, basically saying it's not the case that item is in items between zero and up to the size of the, uh, the array. All right, good. And, oh, Sorry, yeah, yep, yeah, go on. Questions, please. Oh, yeah. Indeed, it should. I wonder what it would do. It would actually be OK in that case. It would just be later on. So let's leave that bug in there, and we'll come back and we'll, we'll check it. Um, so if I take this down here, what I'm basically going to do now is put this down, and then I'm going to put in i, which goes into n, which is not correctly specified. Um, and so at that point, yeah, we've got a problem. That's right. So in fact, you're quite right. So let's just fix that. Perfect. Good. And so the reason I'm showing the properties, I wonder if I can just make it, can I make it a bit bigger? Ugh. Can't quite. Um, it's just to show, you know, because the loop invariants are kind of, they're ugly at times, right? Let's be honest. And so using the properties, it just provides a nice way to make it a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. Um, and we could imagine building up libraries of these properties, which cover lots of useful cases, um, uh, so that we don't have to use sort of raw quantifiers that often. That would be kind of my vision, because basically loop invariants, I don't really like them that much. Um, we've used Wiley for teaching now. Um, last year we had about 170 students, I think it was, um, used Wiley in their second year paper. Um, and, you know, writing specifications is not too, too hard for the students, but dealing with loop invariants is definitely a challenge. Um, and in particular because loop invariants are not really needed. You know, they're only there to help the verifier. They're not there because they're changing the program as to whether it's right or wrong. They're just there so the tool can work, you know? And it's kind of frustrating. So trying to make them better, um, I think definitely is, makes sense, right? Cool. All good? Any questions about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, does it ever feel like you're sort of doing things redundantly if you specify that property <laughs> and then sort of write the same thing in the code? Ah, okay, so this is a good question. Yeah, so the question is, you know, sometimes, um, like, not quite in this case, but definitely with the absolute function, right? What we had in the specification was basically the same as in the code. Um, I think it's a fair question. Um, I guess there, there are two answers. One, as the functions become more interesting, more complex, you definitely see more divergence, right? At this point, we could further refine index of and say that um, it has to be the first one um, in the array that we find not just any one, for example. Um, and, as we st and at that point, we almost are pretty much then restating what the, the function is doing, right? Um, so, I, so I do think that it, as you get more complex, you know, you, you're not going to say everything that a function does. Um, the other aspect of it is, it is, in some sense, yeah, you are kind of double checking what you're doing. That's almost what is going on here. It's a form of mechanical double checking of the program as you wrote it versus what you thought it should be roughly doing. Right? And if we think about how that might help us, you know, we don't need to write so many test cases. So I'm saving 
a fair amount of, of code by just not having to write a whole load of test cases just to check those kinds of things. So although it is causing me some extra you know, writing, I think I'm also saving elsewhere as well. Um, but yeah, it does feel a little bit like you're doing that sometimes, which is okay. But, you know, for the double checking perspective, because you're, you're, you're stating here specific things should, that should be true of the return value compared to the inputs, but you're not saying stuff in between. So it's sort of like a higher level view of it. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's a question. I think if we think about, you know, the project as a whole, part of what I want to do with this project is to try to actually write enough code that I could get a feeling for that and actually other people could get a feeling for, is it worth it? You know, is it, is it frustrating to use this? Is it too detailed? Yeah. Yeah, good question. Yeah. The other thing that raises is I would be um, asking, do you have any plans to sort of cross-check them against each other and make sure that they are actually expressed somehow meaning in a meaningfully different way? Right. Because inevitably, as things run mm. through and you get the sort of hypothetical lazy programmer that is eventually going to turn up, someone's going to write the code go, oh, I think I, they're doing kind of the same thing. Yeah. The code into the, um, yeah, we actually saw I did that, didn't I? I mean, I, I used it, the loop invariant. I copied the post condition and I copied it right yeah. in here. Yeah. I think there would be a strong tendency to write the code, it doesn't verify, copy something in the code yeah. up to the condition, and then you're copy pasting your own. Yeah, yeah I think, but so I, I have... I don't know how easy it would be to go, you've used exactly the same formulation it a different way to make sure. Yeah. So I haven't thought a lot about uh, that redundancy, right? Uh, I think it's an interesting, I think it is an interesting point, especially if you had lots of copy and pasting, you would then be propagating the same misconceptions about what it should be doing. I, that's a fair point, and I'm, I'm, I'm basically going to say, yeah, I don't know, actually, to be honest. I think it makes sense, though. And what I would say, which is what you're basically alluding to here, or to some extent, is that, of course, there can be bugs in the code, but there can be bugs in the specification, right? So, you know, it's not a silver bullet, right? It's not going to magically solve all our problems. It's just a tool for checking what we think, right? Yeah, I mean, there's um, the different bugs that cancel each other. Yeah, and that's right. It, yeah. Worth writing it twice. As long as you've got that bug. redundancy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. That's a, I think that's a fair comment. Same bug, you lose any value. Yeah. If it's just repeated, then it's not helping. Yeah. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. Yep. Cool. Okay. Uh, right. So maybe what we'll do now is we'll maybe just have a look at a few little things related to... Um, uh, I guess you might think of it as taint analysis, um, or something to that effect. Uh, this is pretty simple, okay? I, I don't want to get it, make it too complicated, but it kind of illustrates the rough idea, I think. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a ASCII string. Let's define an ASCII char, actually. Car char is an int x where, and I'm going to be a little bit simple. Um, I'm just going to say an ASCII char is between 0 and 255, okay? So 8-bit ASCII, we're thinking here. 8-bit ASCII. Whoa. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, which is not exactly completely uh, a, a complete, uh, what's the right word, reflection on reality. Um, but it serves a purpose. And we can define a string uh, which is just a, an array of, of these ASCII characters, all right? Um, and so... We might want to now do, and so that's fine. That gives us a concept of an ASCII string. It's not itself that exciting. But we might want to define a notion of an escape string. Okay, I, I'll call it, shall I call it escape string? Maybe that's better. Um, uh, it's a string, string S. Okay, and one of the interesting things is here, so now I can actually start to put some, some requirements on my specification, right, on what's allowed. And I'm, I'm going to be really... Um, S simple. This is not a good way to deal with it. It's not even really a, well, uh, I guess I suppose it's kind of valid. Yeah, it's not a great way to deal with escaping <laughs> anyway. But we'll, we'll, it'll show the point. So let's go. We're just going to basically say, um, for all items up to the length of the array, I'm going to say that um, no item can be equal to my quote character. All right? All right. So in that sense, now, of course, it's not very good. Uh, no, it's not quite right, is it? Sorry. There we go. Um, it's not a very good way to do escape strings because it's not allowing any form of escaping, right? It's basically saying there can be no quotes. Um, what we want to do is refine that and be a little bit more detailed and say we can have quotes provided they're preceded by backslashes, for example, as an example of escape. Okay, so it's a bit limited, but it's just to try and keep it 
a bit more simple. But you get the rough idea. And so um, you can now have um, a function which might do something like, you know, let's, let's think about it like this. Let's, I'll just call it escape, actually. It's probably the right thing. Um, and so I'm passing in a string to escape, and I'm going to return back an escape string. <coughs> All right. Um, and at this point, well, now the tool can start to be helpful. All right. Ooh. It's not liking that. Okay, let's start to fix the simple bugs first. Okay, that's good. And we'll turn off counterexample generation as well because that's going to kill it. Um, and so you start to see at this point that actually it's going to tell us, look, here's a string. It's any old string. You want an escape string, which is any old string except it doesn't have those things. Okay, that's not going to work. Right? And so we're starting to see, you know, that actually we can be potentially quite expressive in, in you know, what we're trying to do with the function. You know, uh, in terms of how we describe what is and isn't escaped and data. Um, and so we can, we can sanitize this uh, roughly as we've seen it before. I'll try to do it, not, I won't take too long on it. Um, but you know, we can go uh, something weird like this. Um, and we're going to go str if str equals my quote character, which is going to be like this. Then I'm just going to do something really dumb. This is really bad sanitization. Okay, I'm just going to put in a space. Okay, oh, it's hideous, but it does the job. All right, and then I can do return str. Um, and at this point, I can then let's put in. So what do I need to do? Uh, I'm going to put in this quantifier. All right, just going to go up to i, which is pretty much what we've seen. Uh, yeah, how's that look? Is that going to work? Not far off, yeah, okay. So now we've written a sanitization function, um, which, okay, yeah, the quantifier's a bit ugly. I could make that a bit nicer using the con contains method, actually. Um, but it's basically just going through and replacing quotes with spaces, okay? It's a bit dumb, but it's working. Um, and now, you know, we've passed the invariant, uh, and we know that our, our string has escaped, right? And, and the key, I guess, here is that we're not using any um, we're not restricted to any specific small set of patterns. We can encode an incredibly wide range of patterns here that we could use for escaping uh, and different kinds of escaping. You know, the tool will be able to reason, for example, that if I take two escape strings and, and uh, append them, you know, we've still got an escape string and these kinds of things, which is useful. Cool. Okay. Um, any, any questions on, on that? That was just a little brief diversion. All right. All right, cool. Okay, okay. So that's my fantastic diagram. Um, okay, so oh yeah. Okay, <laughs> I do want to show this, of course. So let's just do this one here. So let's go. Yeah, cool. All right. Oh, this is a bit big. Okay, so this is my little. Um, this is just to show off a little bit more about Wiley. Um, so this is. Oh man. <laughs> there we go. Okay, and uh, how do I do? I can't remember how I do right click now. I think I do. I do. What do I do? Oh, no. Shift. Yeah, is it shift? Let's see if I can do it now. Hang on. Whoa. Okay. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. There we go. Oh, yeah. That's it. Okay. Cool. Okay. Great. I'm not very good. I keep losing because I'm, I've, now I've, I've lost, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's try it. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Great. I lost again. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so if we, um, so let's just have a look at the JavaScript. So this is the JavaScript that was generated. Um, it kind of looks a little bit like JavaScript, as you might imagine. But uh, you can see there's a little bit of stuff going on here, which is um, name mangling. All right, um, And you can also see that we've put in some assert statements. And so this JavaScript has been generated automatically from some Wiley code. And we can, we can look at that Wiley code if we possibly bring up, uh, sorry, hang on, bring up Emacs. Sweet. Um, let's just maybe try and make that a bit bigger. How do I make it bigger? Options. Sorry. Parents font. Okay. Ooh, that's quite big. All right. So we can see that. Um, 
Yeah, okay, that's probably too big actually. But so we can see here, so I haven't, we haven't looked at records, but Wiley has records which are sort of like structs in C basically. So here's my notion of an exposed square. An exposed square is basically just a record that's got like a rank, which is telling us how many bombs are around it, um, and a Boolean as to whether or not it actually holds a bomb. Okay, so when you expose a square, it'll either, it's either a bomb and you've lost, or it'll print out which rank it is. Um, and likewise, we've got a hidden square down here, and a hidden square is, whoa, oh la la, sorry. A hidden square is just gonna tell us if it's flagged or not, and again, whether or not there's actually a bomb under there, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm combining them together here using a union type, which is basically saying a square is either an exposed square or it's a hidden square. Um, and using that, and there's a bunch of stuff there which I'm going to ignore for now. Using that, we can then start to define our notion of a board, and a board's got an array of squares. I've put on a, uh, a width and height, and I've put on a natural here, um, so those widths and heights cannot be less than zero. And actually, it's pretty clear that I should have written this, right? I should have said something like um, height times width equals size of squares array, right? I should have said that. Um, because obviously we want that invariant to be true for those two fields there, right? Um, and so we start to get into um, the code. Now let's just, I'll just spin on, how are we doing for time? We've still got a bit of time, right? Um, so if we look at the get square function, so this is a function which is gonna basically look into my two-dimensional array and pull out a square at a given position. And so I've got my position is my column and my row, and I've got my board here, and I'm basically saying that the, um, the column has got to be less than the width of the board, and the row has got to be less than the height of the board, and we already know that they're going to be greater than or equal to zero because they're naturals. Um, and then it calculates the row offset. And at this point, I've introduced these assume statements. Um, and so basically, those are hints that I'm giving to the Wiley, to the verifier. It can't reason about nonlinear arithmetic at the moment. So it can't actually reason correctly that when we calculate a row offset, by doing the multiplication that it will be within bounds at this point. So without them, it just returns an error. But you know, it, it, it illustrates a nice way that we can communicate with the, the verifier by sort of overriding what it thinks and giving more information. Um, and so you know, we can start to see that, yeah, the specifications are kind of, they're definitely present in the, in, in the function, you know, in the, in the program, um, and they are useful. We're expressing some, some useful properties here. Um, and if we go back to the JavaScript, uh, which down here, if we look at get square, that's the implementation of get square. Oh, it's very small, sorry. It's too small, isn't it? Um, we can see that those two as assumptions that we made have now been translated into runtime checks. So the system will actually check them for us at runtime. It couldn't do it at, at compile time, okay, but it will do it at runtime. So that's better than nothing, right? Um, and you can also see that actually the code Fortunately, Wiley compiles to, to JavaScript in quite a sort of nice fashion. It actually looks a lot like JavaScript. Um, there are a couple of things that I'm doing here, um, particularly to do with integers, but anyway, I'm going to ignore that for now. All right, I, I haven't implemented big integer, big, big integer arithmetic on the JavaScript side yet, but that is a feature to be done. Cool. Thoughts? Any questions on that? OK. OK. It's just kind of showing what it can do. Um, OK, so I'll say just a few things about it and then pretty much wrap up. Um, so OK, so the question is, well, how does it work? Um, so uh, obviously, a lot of people here are in static analysis, so you will have a pretty good idea already. Um, the key thing about it is, basically, it's going to go through the program, and it's going to generate these verification conditions. And those are the things that need to be shown to be true in order for the program to verify. OK, and it does a path-sensitive traversal of the control flow graph um, in order uh, and so, so, and to extract the verification conditions, basically. Um, and so in this case, this is the absolute function. I've just got this post condition r is greater than equal to zero, and it will go down here into this branch, and it will go down here into this branch. And in fact, um, yeah, this is what it'll look like, right? So we've got it going down this way. And so if I've got, if this is the true branch down here, then I've got x is greater than or equal to zero, and I'm returning x, and that should be then itself greater than or equal to zero. So you end up with a logical implication that says, if x is greater than or equal to zero, then it must be the case that x is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, that's not very difficult to figure out, right? We pass it into the automated theorem prover, which basically takes these first order logic, bits of logic, and decides if they're correct or if they're not correct. Um, 
Obviously, it's not going to have too much difficulty with that one. Uh, and on the false branch, you end up with a verification condition which says basically if x is greater than, sorry, less than zero, then it must be the case that minus x is greater than or equal to zero. It's perhaps a little bit more challenging, but still not very challenging for the tool. You chuck it into the SMT solver and it basically says, yes, that's good. And if it says, no, that's not good, then we start to think about how we can find a counterexample at that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so one of the interesting things about Wiley is that it has these verification conditions can actually, they have a domain-specific assertion language in which they can be expressed. So as a, as a kind of programmer, it, it's not clear to me how often people would want to do this, but um, what you can do is you can actually generate the verification conditions yourself and then look at them and decide actually, it, you know, is the tool generating the right verification condition or is it the case that maybe, you know, it can help you figure out it's missing something and you need to back propagate that in your, into your program to figure out um, uh, you know, where the problem is arising. But it, it's very helpful for debugging, basically. Um, and so you can actually print them all out and you can then run uh, the theorem prover itself and print out the proof as well of these assertions and check them. So you can check at each stage um, of the process. Cool. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I'm not going to say too much more. There's a whole bunch of different people that's been involved in that. In fact, even more now. Um, in particular, Mark Utting, from the, um, who's currently at the University of Sunshine Coast. He was formerly at University of Waikato. Some of you may um, have met. Um, and he's been looking at uh, translating Wiley um, and using the boogie verification system, which is based on Z3, um, to verify Wiley programs, which has been, which has been quite cool. Um, and, oh, there's a Wiley language specification. Oh, do I have a printout in my, in my bag? Hang on. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Here we go. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. See? It, it exists. <laughs> it's not just a picture. It is real. Look, it's got pages and everything. Um, it's, it's still got a way to go to being complete, I would have to say. That would be an understatement of the decade. But um, there is a lot of stuff in there, that's for sure. Um, so, you know, you can find out a lot about the syntax of the language. Um, from the language specification. Cool. Other than that, um, you can check it out and download it at wiley.org. Um, and feel free to email me if you're interested, you have questions. I'd love to answer questions about Wiley. You know, I could talk all day about it, that's for sure. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much. Sorry? Can you write a precondition oh, in the language? Did we not see one? It was in the, uh, it was in the yeah. mine hub suite, for example, but other than that. It's yeah, you're right. Uh, I was going to show another one, but I um, went and did the um, escape stuff instead. Uh, yeah, so an example would be if I wanted to do the max of an array, OK? Um, so the max of an array is a good example. Um, because the max is basically finding the maximum element of an array. Um, the, the max of an empty array does not make sense, right? So in order to do this function, you have to write a precondition that says the array has got to be greater than or equal to zero. Or great, sorry, greater than zero, as in not empty, not an empty array. So yeah, so you can write it with this, this requires clause. Yeah, yeah, good question. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you mean how do I implement that on yeah. the back end? Yeah, so there's two answers to that question. So on the so this compiles down to uh, Java bytecode. It's probably the main uh, back end at the moment, and that it then compiles integers to big integer. Um, however, uh, you know we can imagine uh, writing a type like this, which is pretty much what we had before. Oh, crikey, sorry. Right, and at this point, you know, I could then compile that down to you know a byte or something in Java, right? For example. So I haven't, uh, I haven't spent a lot of time on that. It's just a case of you know managing the project. Um, but certainly that would be my goal. My goal would be to compile as much as possible to native to primitive types. Yeah, definitely. So like on the JavaScript um, example that I showed you, um, it was just compiling them down to JavaScript numbers, which are not unbounded. Um, and so, you know, I would definitely need to um, add in a big arithmetic library to deal with that properly. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a good question. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, what about in 
So, okay, so that's an interesting question. Yeah, I guess especially, um, you know, coming from the background here with the, with the group. Um, so everything, all of the checking is done, um, it, it's all, you know, checked intra-procedurally, right? Now, yeah, it, it means that if I try to call a function, so let's just do something like this. Um, so let's take that u8 just because I've got it lying around, um, and I'm just going to return an int, it doesn't matter. So let's go return x, okay? If I've got a function g, and let's say I take an x here, Whoops, thank you. Uh, and I did something like that. Then at that point, it's going to tell me um, the, the error message is not super helpful, <laughs> I'll be honest. Could definitely be improved. Um, but basically, what it's saying is that cannot flow into that, right? So it, it's checking it intra procedurally, but it, it, we are still checking invalid things cannot cross function boundaries. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and we can. I guess we can sort of prove that, I suppose. If we just do this, it should then presumably work. Yeah, OK. So, yeah. Yeah. So, that, is that sort of what you're asking? Yeah, I was thinking of a use case that would be like if I'm going to use, for example, a, a library or an API, and I would like just the post conditions for this, from this API to be propagated in my program. And right. Be checked. So oh. I was wondering if there was any notion yeah. of flow of post conditions. For yeah, I mean, so, OK. So, let's, let's maybe do something. Um, What's a good example? Let's just try and put a, some strange constraint. R is greater than 1, OK? That's kind of weird. And I'll just return 1, OK? Um, so in here, you know, I might have int x equals f of x. Let's say that's all going to work out. And then I'm going to go, if x is less than 0, see, I wonder what it's going to do. This could be weird. OK. Um, I wonder. Hmm. Sorry. Uh, ooh, oh, I've already got two variables named x. Let's change that one to be y or something. I don't know. <laughs> Is that what it's saying? Uh, whoops. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that one's. So this one's interesting here because this case should not be possible, right? So I should be able to say something like that, and it should be actually okay with that. So it is reasoning at that point that x is greater than one. Um, I'm trying to think what would be a, what's a good example. Let's okay. Let's do this. Let's go return x, and then let's go x equals x plus one, and then I can go ensures r is greater than two at that point. All right? Yeah. So then it's taking the post condition here as something it knows about x that it's greater than one, and then when I'm adding to it, it's then going r. Oh, if it's greater than one, and I add to it, now I know it's greater than two. And there we go, and it meets that post condition there. So yeah, it will, it'll take what you know, but only what you specify in the function, not the body. It won't look into the body, right? That's the key. Um, so whatever you specify there, it'll take it there, and it'll carry on using it as much as it can, basically. Yeah. 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 If that example, if you added another function in between there, so like g calls h calls f, h doesn't do anything except for that. So h, g calls h, and h calls f. Is that, is that what I... Yeah. Why, I think it's like this. Uh, that's not going to work. Right. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because, yeah, you're quite right. So the key thing that's happening here is that we're basically throwing away that post-condition information. We had it here, and, and when we made the return here, we could have actually written a post-condition, but we didn't, and so we've lost it now. Yeah. Yeah, and you know the reason for that, as as many people would understand, is I don't want to do interprocedural analysis. It's too hard. It, this is already difficult in terms of time. Yeah, yeah, cool. Could you do like automatic uh, yeah. So so okay. So so you're asking, could we actually then infer the specification? Because we know that this function calls this one here. Therefore, it must be the case that we get this, right? So we could try to infer it. Um, so that is a good question. It's not something I've, I've like really looked at yet. But in terms of you know, inferring specifications automatically, yes, that is something that I think would be very interesting. It's not easy. Um, there was a very uh, well-known paper called Snugglebug. I don't know, some of you may have heard of the Snugglebug paper. Um, and they tried to do that for Java programs. And that would be the kind of technology that you could, you could bring here. But yeah, it's hard because yeah, it's definitely interprocedural at that point, right? Yeah. But that's a good project.
Definitely, definitely. Cool, good. Oh, great questions. Yeah. Similar question. I was wondering if you plan to look into loop inference. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay, so that, that's a really good, um, good question. Uh, so the question is, inferring the loop invariants. The loop invariants are really annoying to write. Can we actually infer them automatically? Um, so there's actually another tool. There's a competitor tool, um, which is called Daphne. Some of you, I don't know, some of you may have heard of Daphne. Um, and so actually Daphne will infer simple loop invariants. Like if you write, uh, if you want to say i is greater than or equal to zero, then it will actually infer that for you. Um, so yes, that's something that I think is interesting. I've actually got a student in Wellington who's doing a finally a project on doing that. Um, but we're, he, you know, we're only going for those relatively easy cases that you can do, like with a like a sign analysis or something like that. You know, um, the interesting ones are where you have a post condition and you want to back propagate from the post condition that you're looking for to the loop, and then you go, okay. It's got to look roughly like that post condition, but I need to do the twiddle, you know, make it instead of going up to the size, but go up to the inductor, you know, the index variable. So we haven't really explored that. Um, but yeah, this is exactly the kind of stuff I want to basically play around with. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So you showed preconditions, post conditions, loop invariance, and the type. Type invariance, yeah. Um, are there any other places where you can um, specify for type? Hmm. Don't think so. Sorry? Uh, yeah, the assert statement. The assert statement you can write. So that can help you with debugging. So, you know, you could write something here and go assert uh, y, I don't know, is greater than zero, which is not true in this case. Um, and it'll go, oh, no, that's not correct. Um, so it can help you for debugging what you think is true at a given point versus what the tool actually knows. And beyond that, no, no, that's it. Yeah, um, uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, that covers basically pretty much everything. I, I want, I'm interested in uh, so potentially doing some kind of a lie guarantee reasoning, which means you then add not a loop invariant, but you'd have a notion of a variant. So you're going to say how the variable is allowed to change in time, um, which is quite interesting. Um, yeah. So then you could prove termination. So, you know, I can't prove termination, for example, and I'd need something like that to do that. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Cool. Okay. All righty. Um, have you looked at any sort of, um, I guess, the user experience side of things mm -hmm. in that, like, as you were saying before, it seems as though it <coughs> provides a lot of tools, assuming it's not burdensome on the user. I think it would, it would be neat if you could get something to sort of visualize what it knows in any... Yeah. Like in the case where it was propagating the, um, <coughs> the ensures from the previous function, mm -hmm. it would be really cool I think if you could have something that would like generate a comment for you in say G that goes, we've called H. Yeah, so, so that's what we know at that point. No. Yeah. Um, from H, yeah. you have got like um, append a comment on that yeah. automatically. So, so someone else actually, I was talking to someone else just... Got a post condition that we know work with that. Yeah. So, so I was talking to someone in Malula Bar actually about that. So roughly speaking, I mean, so the tool does know all of the kind of assertions in between. And so it could actually write in what it knows at that point as a comment, for example. And that, that could be helpful for debugging what's going on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think my concern is that they, the, they could get quite big. That's probably my concern. And so you need to think about how to sort of focus it on what you're interested in. But yeah, I think, you know, I, I think to answer your question really, which is have I spent a lot of time thinking about the user interface side of it? Unfortunately, the answer is probably not that much. Um, not to say that it's not important. It's just I just haven't really managed to get to it. You know, like even adding the counterexample generation is already quite helpful yeah, right. in figuring stuff out, you know. Um, and that didn't even take me that long, so I really should have done a bit more. Um, and the error messages are not that helpful either at times. So I think there's a lot of work to do on making it more usable. Yeah. yeah. I guess the other thing that I think would be neat would be some kind of visualization for the code base to say what level of proof you think you've got on okay. it. So you can mark, you know, yeah. this, this function is, yeah. however, we think that this function is fairly heavily verified, this function is not yeah. verified at all. So, so it's definitely the case at the moment. Um, that someone's going to do this for a whole code base immediately when they write it. They can right. start writing it, and do some, the important yeah. bits, and go back later and keep 
Probably yeah. Try and keep it up. So yeah, at the moment, basically, it recompiles all the functions and re-verifies all of them, right? Um, and you're totally right. One problem in that whole lot, and it won't work. Yeah, it'll it'll report an error, obviously, for the file, right? So if I could have some way to say, you know, at no verify or something like that, yeah, I think that makes sense. You know, pragmatically, it's a useful thing to do. Um, and you know, the other interesting sort of issues along those lines, which are doing incremental recompilation as opposed to just redoing everything because although you know I think it looked reasonably quick here in reality when we have a reasonable sized file it starts to slow down for sure yeah yeah good question mm. um, question about performance what SMP cover are you using in the back <laughs> that's a good question uh, so the answer is I'm using my own SMT solver uh, and I have got a whole talk where I could talk about how that works but I'm not unfortunately going to get into it um, it is so it's interesting because with my SMT solver, the goal, I'm not so worried about performance. Like, from my perspective, the performance is, is pretty good. What I'm trying to do is to make it more uh, sort of accessible. So, for example, you can see the proofs that it's generated and you can check them, right? Um, it will provide counterexamples, right? And these, I need to do more on the counterexample generation. But, you know, I want to try to, I'm, I want to focus more on making it a useful part of the system rather than just really, really fast, which is what, People like, Z, you know, the Z3 tool focuses on a lot. You know, for Z3, they're interested in, um, you know, verification conditions that have thousands or tens of thousands of variables. In fact, for, for you know, the kinds of things I'm doing here, typically you have like 10 variables, right? So performance is not the major concern. It's more those other things that I think are important. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, that's an interesting choice. People often ask me why I did that, but... I just like to know things, so <laughs> it's just fun. I enjoy it, right? And it, you know, basically, I've learned heaps doing it, and it's, you know, it's not going too badly. Um, <laughs> yeah. What language did you write your SMT solver in? So it's all written, everything we've seen so far is written in Java. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah. What was the C backend? I saw someone contributing to Wiley. Yeah. C backend. Yeah, one of, we, I've done a whole bunch of different projects, so. Um, you know, lots of compiling to JavaScript, WebAssembly, oh. compiling to C. So we made it run on this quadcopter. Um, and the idea was I was going to verify the code, but I haven't done that. Not yet, anyway. Um, but we made it run on the quadcopter. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, there would have been, you know, there would have been some of the standard library and stuff would have been in C, yeah. But, um, yeah, so it's all on Maven as well. So, you know, if you want to pull it into one of your projects and start using it, yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Okay, last question. <laughs> well, with your students, like how large a program were they able to write before they thought it's too complicated? You mentioned something about complicated. Uh, so, yeah, so we've used, so in the course um, SWAN224, um, I had, yeah, about 170 students and we did a whole lot of assignments. The thing is, most of the assignments were focused on these kind of relatively simple array manipulation programs. Um, and that's, that's okay for them. The only problem really for them is the loop invariance, because the question is, well, when do they need a loop invariant? Why do they need a loop invariant? You know, Because it, it, it's kind of straightforward to say, well, I need a postcondition because this is what the function does. Or I need a precondition because it's assuming that the array is not empty. right? You know, they, they don't have any problems with that. But then it's like, well, why do I need a loop invariant? My program is correct. Well, yes, your program is correct, but you still do because you have to convince the verifier that it's correct. Well, uh, why do I need to do that? And what are the circumstances when I need to do that? Well, the circumstance is if you assign to a variable inside the loop, you'll need to say something in the loop of variant about that variable. Huh, why is that then? Well, that's because how whole logic works. And then it's like, ah, <laughs> you know. Um, so that is a difficult one to try and explain. And I have a kind of, you know, a spiel that I use to try and help them understand when they should and shouldn't write them. But it is a problem. It is a problem, yeah. Other than that, basically, it's good. Um, in fact, they really like using the tool. The only thing they don't like um, is when it fails to verify because of a, you know, a bug or a problem in the system. Um, and what we've seen today is probably 10 times better than what I had this time last year. Um, so it should be able to verify everything they're doing. So hopefully, they're going to be super happy at the end. We'll see. Um, it just sometimes, when we did some of the array ones, as they got more complicated, it just wouldn't be able to verify them, even though they were correct. And that's frustrating for them because then they can't tell is it they've made a mistake? Because sometimes it is subtle when you get it right and wrong. Um, or is it my tool? And then, then it loses that sort of trust, you know, it's sort of a breakdown at that point. Yeah. 
Cool. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Now let's thank David again. Probably one more talk. Cheers.